Well, yeah, hi everyone. It's really nice to meet you. Um, and it's really strange not to be able to see you, but, um, but I'm just going to imagine you there. Um, so I'm going to talk about lots of things. Um, I'm going to take a talk about my journey, where I've come from, and the kind of things that I do now. Um, I've done lots of things, um, and I'm going to talk about a few. So until very recently, I was this. I was head of school for communication design here at the university. And that means um, I was responsible for all of our graphic design courses, illustration, animation, computer games, these kinds of areas. And, um, around about one and a half thousand students in total. Um, but, and I'll come to this at the end of the presentation, um, I've recently changed. So now I, I've gone back to my own design practice. And I think this kind of, this fits. You'll see that this fits into my kind of journey. I've never really done anything for too long. Um, so how did I get here? Um, I'm, from a, I'm from a really strange town called Great Yarmouth. Um, which is on the East Coast in the UK. And it's one of those towns that's really kind of faded. It doesn't look faded in this image, but it's really kind of faded. It's one of those places that people don't really go to anymore. Um, it used to have a really thriving fishing industry. And my kind of aspiration when I was a child, I wanted to be a fisherman because all of the men in my family had been fishermen. And I thought to be a, to be a man, you had to be a fisherman. So that was what I wanted to do. Is a little video of the fishing industry. Um, this was quite a long while ago. This, this, this is a, uh, you know, kind of turn of the century, turn of the last century. Um, so my kind of aspirations were here, but but the world's changed a lot, hasn't it? So um, and it's kind of changed beyond recognition. You know, even over the last, you know, twenty five years or so. Um, so when I finished. Uh, when I finished school, I kind of didn't know what to do. So I ended up working in a fish and chip shop for a while because that seemed like it was kind of related. And also it was easy. Um, didn't require very much kind of brain power. And in retrospect, this was kind of a really good thing because it gave me time to think and gave me time to earn some money and really contemplate what it was that I wanted to do. Um, there is a, a bit of a story here as well, actually. Um, when I worked in this fish and chip shop, I worked with a guy who was an illegal immigrant. He was from Pakistan and he was really very qualified. He was a doctor, a medical doctor. And he, you know, we became really good friends over the year or so. And he told me that I was wasting my life. I had so many kind of opportunities and I was wasting them. And I'm really very glad that I listened to him because it was, it was because of his input. That I ended up going to this place, which was my local art school. Um, so maybe this is the beginning of the story that you want to hear. Um, art school for me was amazing. Um, I met really interesting people. I was exposed to really interesting things. And so looking at your screen here on the left hand side, there's an image um, from a magazine called Ray Gun. Um, Ray Gun was like my kind of Bible. Um, it was you know, fascinating in terms of its design, fascinating in terms of music and fashion and um, yeah, it was just really kind of thrilling. And so this image here on the left-hand side is from 1998, but I was reading this magazine around about 1989. Uh, my tutors at art school pointed out things like this piece of work on the right-hand side. Um, so this is a piece of work by a, an Italian futurist poet called Marinetti. And this was produced in 1910. So this dates to around about the same time as this. You know, can you believe it? It looks so incredibly modern. And it really kind of blew my mind. And it was, it was these kinds of things. It was these kinds of people. It was my tutors who really got me excited um, about the kind of potential, I think. Um, okay, so now another, another kind of tangent in a way. Um, but these are some illustrations that I made when I was, you know, 17 or 18 years old. And these are photographic illustrations um, of a poem. Uh, by Seamus Heaney, and I was really inspired. I copied, really, my hero, who was a guy called Vaughan Oliver, who was responsible for lots of album artwork. Um, he worked for a company called 4AD, and he was the art director for this company. Um, and so you can see that there's a kind of fairly clear relationship between my images here and the kind of things that he was doing. 
I guess my kind of advice here is that when you're kind of starting out, you can copy, you know, you can work out how and why people have done things through almost kind of emulation, copying their work. Um, it, it helps you to develop your own skills. Uh, this is a photograph of Vaughan Oliver. He very sadly died just, just, after, just, yeah, just after Christmas and his, um, his funeral was last Friday. Um, but he was a real kind of inspiration to me. Um, when I first started working for UCA, and I was responsible for some graphic design courses in Epsom, um, I found out that he lived around the corner um, from the Epsom campus. So I went and knocked on his door and asked him to come in and do some teaching for me. And he did, um, and he did for a long time. So he did for years and years. Um, we also have all of his artwork, everything that he's ever made in our library in, um, in Epsom, in our Epsom campus, all his original artwork, which is a fantastic resource for our students. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. Um, I'm going to turn the sound off there. And just tell you that this is the band Pixies. Um, so the album artwork I was really inspired by, that I copied when I was 17 or 18. And this is the band that the artwork is for. And the reason I'm showing you this is that this is something that our, this is something that our the illustration that we they worked on this world tour. The, the kind of moving image of artwork is designed and made by our students. So these are three levels. So these are people who have finished their degree, but they're working really Okay, so next thing, uh, quite briefly again. You know, going to art school is an amazing experience. You meet some really, really interesting people. And for me, this was kind of, it, it wasn't so much later that I realized quite how important these people are, you know, were and continue to be. So a couple of examples, this guy, Marcus, um, he's an illustrator, but I met him on my first day at art school and we continue to work together to this day. Um, he lives in Edinburgh, actually, um, where other Jamie lives. Um, which is interesting. So he moved up to Edinburgh a few years ago um, and yeah, he continues his practice there. Uh, this is a double page spread from a magazine called GQ, um, which featured him. And the photograph is by a guy called Jason Evans, um, who's another friend. So this is one of Jason Evans's photographs. I'm gonna talk a bit later about how portable your kind of degree is and how it can take you to lots of different places. But Jason's a good example of this. He studied sculpture, actually, but he, he works as a photographer. And you can see just from this image, he's working as a fashion photographer here, that, um, uh, you know, this isn't kind of normal fashion photography. This is someone who, you know, uses the models almost as if you might use kind of elements in a still life. He arranges people and then he photographs them. Um, so yeah, he's a, he's a really interesting guy and I continue to work with both of these people and actually both of these people, Marcus and Jason, have taught for me, um, taught for me at the university too. Okay, so I worked in a fish and chip shop, didn't know what I wanted to do. I went to art school. Um, I then really wanted to please my parents because I'm a really nice boy, or was anyway. And so um, my parents, because they hadn't gone to university, they... Um, they, they didn't really kind of understand what art and design was. I wanted to be a graphic designer, but they didn't quite understand. And I can understand this now. Um, so I decided that I was going to study architecture. Um, and, and this was a great move, actually, a great move for me. I learned an awful lot through the study of architecture. Um, when I graduated, though, I knew I didn't really want to be an architect. I wanted to do something else. And it took me a long while before I kind of, I had a lucky break. And I ended up working for this company called Spears & Major. Um, so with Spears and Major, one of the reasons I was employed by them is because I can draw. This is one of my drawings. Um, this is a drawing, a concept drawing of a building called the Millennium Dome in London. Um, this is the building. This is the building on completion. Um, this is another image of the building. So you can see that it's huge. 
And my role here is part of a really big team designing lighting um, for this architectural scheme. What I'm going to do now is flick through quite a lot of images from my time as a lighting designer and before I come to something else. So these are all images of the Millennium Dome. Um, this is a project called Gateshead Millennium Bridge. So maybe people who've been up to Newcastle Gateshead um, in the UK may have seen this. So this is working with some architects called Wilkinson Air. Um, this won a Sterling Architecture Prize. I've, I've worked on a number of projects that have won um, kind of important architecture prizes. Uh, this is a project called um, Magna, which is in Rotherham, again in the north of England. And this is a kind of museum-ish kind of visitor experience space, and it's huge. So it is in the largest, um, it's the largest or was the largest steel making shed in Europe. And within it are inserted these pavilions that tell the story of the steel making process. So a really interesting, really interesting project for me. Um, this is something called uh, the, what was it called? IBM eBusiness Innovation Center that seems really dated now. I'm going to flick through this one. Um, those of you who have been to London, you may recognize this. This is a project called um, Golden Jubilee Bridges. And it crosses the Thames, spans the Thames between the Royal Festival Hall and Charing Cross Station. So I really enjoyed my time working as an architectural lighting designer, worked on projects like this. And so this is another, um, you know, multi award winning project working with Foster and Partners. Um, it's the headquarters of a, of a bank or a bank and other businesses in the centre of London in the city. This though, there's a kind of story here. This, this was the kind of beginning of the end, I think, for me in um, architectural lighting. Um, and it was partly because, partly because of, or triggered by kind of environmental concerns at this point, uh, or wanting to do something else, wanting to do something that, that meant something else, had a different kind of meaning for me. Um, but this is an interesting project because rather than lighting it from the outside, which we would generally do, lots of kind of show lighting, here we were, um, lighting the building uh, or, or kind of revealing the form of the building only using the kind of spill light. So only using the kind of functional light from within the building and letting it spill out the windows. The cucumber building. So this one's, uh, this one's called Swiss Re or 30 St. Mary Axe or the gherkin. So the cucumber is the right phrase because here we call it the gherkin. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting project. This is the outside, the entrance to Swiss Re. Um, I'm getting there. This is, this is actually my favorite project and it was one of the smallest that I worked on. Um, this is called um, Bridge of Aspiration and it's part of the Royal Ballet School in London. And it crosses, uh, crosses the street at kind of second floor level. Um, and the form is beautiful. So it's a, it's a bridge that is part of the Royal Ballet School and even the bridge, or particularly the bridge, reveals or, or gives you a kind of clue and insight into what happens within the building. It kind of dances across the streets. I think it's really beautiful. So uh, I think finally, no, maybe not finally, I'm not sure what I've got next. Um, I worked on lots and lots of, um, lots and lots of uh, international projects as well. So I'm just going to show you one that maybe you'll recognize, which is in uh, Dubai. Um, it's called Burj Al Arab. Um, yeah, an amazing, an amazing hotel. And to give you a sense of scale here, um, that kind of round thing at the top or towards the top of the building is a helicopter landing pad. Um, it's really huge. I've got another question. Did I use CAD to, to, to draw the picture? Um, the picture I showed you first was actually hand drawn. Um, it was drawn on um, kind of black or dark colored, uh, lovely quality paper. And I used, um, I used uh, pencils, pencils and some chalk. Okay, so uh, I wanted to do something else. And this is, um, this is a kind of curse and a blessing, I think. Um, I get bored. And so I started doing other things um, uh, with the studio. And so I proposed that we, um, we designed an exhibition so we could tell other people about what we do. But, but more than that, I wanted, to, I wanted it to be a kind of educational thing. Um, yeah, I wanted to really excite people about, um, really excite people about 
about light because I think it's a kind of magical, it's a magical thing, architectural lighting. So I designed this exhibition and the exhibition then became a book, um, this book. So I, I part wrote it, I designed it, I took an awful lot of the photographs for this, including the cover image. And this was, uh, this was really successful, this project. Um, we, I, you know, I notice on our architecture courses here at the university, architecture and interior design courses, that this is on their reading list even now. And this book is, you know, 15 years old or so now. But it gave me kind of itchy feet. So these are some spreads. Um, yeah, so it gave me kind of itchy feet. I wanted to do something else. And, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I, but I did want to go back and study. You know, I love... I love, um, I love learning about stuff. You know, I love uh, experimenting and playing. And it seemed like a good idea to go back to university to do this. And so I, um, yeah, so I went back to university and studied uh, communication design. But I didn't do this in a very conventional way because what I ended up doing is pulling my kind of interests into this. My friends, my peers were interested in graphic design. I was interested in kind of image making. Um, but image making using some of the, the kind of materials, the technology that I was used to, but in a much smaller way. Um, so here, this is, a, this is a really fairly simple device um, made using cardboard and uh, bits of piano wire and LEDs and speakers and things that I bought on them um, uh, you know, from, a, from a department store. And I cut up the devices and I stuck them back together again. And what this machine does is it visually interprets a record. So you can play a record and the arms on top of this platter bounce up and down and there are LEDs on the end and they wiggle around and they give you an idea of the, the kind of sound, the frequency, the resonance of the record that's playing. And so this is a, this is a kind of fudged together version of how this thing works. Um, because the, the outcome actually looks like this. This was my kind of final outcome. So this is, um, this is uh, one photograph. It's a photograph of the machine in action. The length of time it takes to take the photograph is the length of time it takes to play the record. And so this is something like a three and a half minute exposure. And it's a photograph of a record by a guy called Tapazuki, um, a Jamaican kind of dub artist. So this is kind of interesting, isn't it? I'm doing something that's, that's it's very free. Um, it's not at all like the kind of commercial work that I've done, but I'm a, I'm a designer. And when I graduated from this course, I really wanted to do something with it. I really wanted to use some of these devices that I've made, partly to make money and partly just to see what kind of other audiences they might be relevant to. So here, um, I'm working for an advertising agency called Fallon based in London and making images for them. Um, and I'll come back to Fallon and Sony a bit later. Um, I also use the machine to illustrate a book about experimental music. Um, so making these kind of experimental illustrations based on the pieces of music that I was given. Um, I also did quite a lot of work for a record label called um, Excel Recordings based in London. And one of the artists on their roster is, um, is the White Stripes. And so these were images for the band, the White Stripes, when they played a small gig in London. And at one point, these were animated, these images. So I'd, I'd, uh, I really enjoyed this process. I really enjoyed the kind of making something, making some kind of machine or device, and then doing something with it. And so I did this lots and lots of times. So I'm just going to give you another few examples. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a device that spins around some LEDs and the LEDs flash and using a, a phenomena called persistence of vision, it tricks your brain through your kind of eye to see something that's not really there. Um, and so what this machine can do, it can write type in the air. So that's interesting, isn't it? And then, then what I... I used this machine for a commercial project. So this was the cover for a book called Reinvented. And so the brief was just to typographically um, write the title of this book on the cover, which is what I've done using this machine. Um, 
again, I'm a designer though. And I think one of the things that I really enjoy is, um, I guess the kind of entrepreneurial aspects of design. You know, I like to take something and I like to work out what else we can do with it. And so here I'm, I'm working with um, two friends actually, uh, who I shared a studio with. And we ended up founding a company called Lightvert. Um, and what we did is we took this phenomena of uh, persistence of vision phenomena and we scaled it up. And the thing that we've done differently here is that this device can be deployed really quite easily. You can unfurl it from the side of a building or you can hang it from a crane at a music festival. Um, and, and advertisers generally can then use it to, um, to you know, to sell their kind of products, um, those kinds of things. So it's kind of an interesting aside from something that started off really small. You know, you end up with this thing that has, you know, completely different scale, a completely different function. Um, another example of this kind of experimental process, um, this time it's a robot and the robot has LEDs on its back. And what the robot does is it, it's looking for a line. It's a line following robot. But if you present it with a broken line, it kind of doesn't know what to do. So it goes around in circles and the circles become bigger and bigger until it finds its way again. Um, and just like the other kind of examples that I've shown you, you know, I end up doing something with it. These are the very first photographs. I used it again for um, work with or work for Sony while I was with the advertising agency Fallon. Um, I was also asked, and, and I guess this is a, an example of how, you know, every now and again a kind of interesting opportunity comes up. And I've been quite lucky that there have been quite a lot of these. Um, I was commissioned by a company called Meta Design in San Francisco um, to produce some digits for them using this robot. So the robot's kind of tracing, uh, tracing lines and um, and I'm photographing the robot tracing lines and you end up with these really kind of interesting um, illuminated letter forms. Uh, I was then commissioned to do this for them lots of times uh, and then I was asked to go and work for Meta Design for a while. So I spent a, a year living and working in San Francisco um, for Meta Design and one of the clients that I worked with uh, was Adobe. And so here what I'm doing, you can see that there's a relationship between these images and this image, um, because these images, the starting point for them was this, and then it was inverted, and then we did other things to it. Um, so I do think a, an awful lot of our kind of creative, my creative career has been informed by, or led by kind of chance and happenstance and serendipity. And, you know, these things kind of happen and every now and again, you know, you just gotta go for it. You know, you just gotta, you just, you've just gotta go for it. You've just gotta kind of step into the unknown and see what happens. I think um, that's one of the kind of themes of my career, I suppose. Okay, we're getting there. Um, so one of my, one of the projects I'm proudest of, um, and here again, I'm working for a company called Fallon, the same advertising agency based in London. And by this point, I'm, I'm pretty good friends with a guy called Juan Cabral who's a, a really amazing Argentinian creative director. Um, he does lot, he does movies now. Um, but because of the other projects that I'd worked with him on, he asked me to, to work on this. And so the brief was, Sony uh, have a new TV set. Um, they want to tell people about the amazing color reproduction of their TV set. And our job was to kind of visualize this or communicate this in a really interesting way. So this is what we came up with. I'm just going to show you the video. Okay, so hopefully you can see this okay. Um, and hope, hope I, I guess you may well have seen this before. Um, if you haven't, I'm gonna explain what it is. Um, it looks like lots of kind of colored dots. Um, it's actually lots of colored balls bouncing down a street in San Francisco. 
Um, and I think the really interesting things about this project are the scale. I mean, it's a really simple idea. Um, we're going to bounce some balls down the street in San Francisco. The ball's going to be nice and colourful, and we're going to film it. Um, the reason, one of the reasons this works is because it's filmed beautifully and because of the scale. Um, so here there's 250,000 balls bouncing down the street. Um, so we, we wanted a million balls, <laughs> but we couldn't get hold of a million. Um, we could only get hold of the 250,000. We pretty much bought every bouncy ball in all of the United States. Um, and there are some really interesting kind of practical things. And so we had to launch these balls from the top of the street. And so we had three huge cannons constructed using um, a special effects company based in Hollywood. Um, we only got one chance to film this. Um, so everything had to be meticulously planned because you can't, well, you could, but we couldn't collect all the balls and then take them back to the top of the streets again. Um, in terms of how much this cost, a huge amount of money, um, I don't even know. I wasn't kind of party to that. I wasn't kind of writing the checks, but the budget was huge. And, and it was really well spent because, um, because the advert won loads and loads of awards. It won something called a, a Golden Lion at Cannes, which is the kind of Oscars of the, of the um, advertising industry. So it did incredibly well. So an interesting project. So around about this time though, you know, I've talked about, um, you know, creative careers taking twists and turns, and you can definitely see that through the work I've shown you so far. Um, but your life takes other twists and turns. And so for me, I was, I was actually back in San Francisco, living there, having a great time, and my dad became ill. Um, so, so I needed to come back to the UK. I needed to come back to see him. We didn't think he was gonna survive. Uh, he's still alive now, and this is years ago, so things, are, things, were, things worked out all right. Um, but my, my story is I was in a, in a queue in a supermarket buying some fruit for my dad um, to take to the hospital. And in front of me was my old art college tutor um, from when I first went to art school. And, you know, we ended up getting, uh, getting chatting and he asked me what I was doing and I told him and he asked me to come in and do a presentation to his students, um, which I did. Um, and then he asked me to do some teaching for him, which I did. And this was my first kind of experience of teaching, you know, completely by chance. And I loved it. Um, yeah, I loved it. So, so I've been doing it ever since. So um, I've been doing it ever since, but then also other things. Uh -huh, yeah, there's a question, is that Arduino? It is. And so this is a, an Arduino controlled robot. Um, so this, these are the kind of, or one of the kind of things that I do now. This is an Arduino controlled robot. And what it does is it listens to or follows um, Twitter feeds, um, a selection of Twitter feeds. And depending on the instances of certain words, so for example, the number of times people say love on Valentine's or hate or something, it will do different things in response. Um, so it's kind of an interesting project. Um, you'll see that quite a lot of my work recently has kind of turned to tech. Um, so I'm one of the European, one of the European creative consultants for Nest. So Nest is a Google company and my job is to suggest other things that they might be able to do with the embedded kind of sensing technology within their devices. Um, so I get to kind of test things and then suggest what else they might do with them. Um, the other thing, I mentioned fashion in my um, biography. So my sister followed my footsteps. She went to university and she studied fashion rather than architecture. Um, she's worked for some really interesting people. So she, was at, um, she worked for Louis Vuitton and uh, Paul and Joe in Paris. And then she came back to the UK and worked in London for really boring people like, um, like uh, Thomas Pink. <laughs> um, but the really interesting thing about working for Thomas Pink is that she learned an awful lot about the industry. Um, a few years ago, she stopped working for Thomas Pink and set up her own company. So her and I um, co-own this company called Dobson, which is my surname, her surname. And what we do is we make or design and manufacture um, menswear, mostly jackets. And so if you, you know, you can look this up online, we may mostly make men's, men's jackets. And the interesting thing for us is that we sell nearly all of our products in Japan. Um, 
yeah so it's um, a kind of interesting side project for me at the beginning of the presentation um, I mentioned that, uh, that until recently I was head of school for communication design and one of the reasons I was formally head of school for communi communication design I no longer do this is that um, that my kind of private work has, has well, there's just too much of it and I can't do both um, so one of the projects I worked on recently, which I can't tell you very much about, but I like to kind of allude to, um, is for Apple. So I, I made a machine, I photographed the machine. Um, the photographs of the machine are gonna be used by Apple at some point in the future um, for a new product or service. But that's about as much as I can tell you at the moment. But these kind of projects, these freelance projects, um, are really kind of exciting and I think help, help me be more credible in terms of my teaching practice um, and yeah keep me kind of enthusiastic and connected and I think that's really really important when it comes to teaching our students right I'm going to shift gears now I'm, I'm aware I'm talking really quickly um, and I do want to leave some time for questions at the end because I think we've got quite a lot um, but I just want to show you some examples of my graduate work so these are these are my students these are people that I've known most of them and I want to give you some examples of the things that they go on to do because, because it might not be what you expect. So um, one of my graphic design graduates, a guy called Phil Stewart, um, he graduated from here maybe 10 years ago now. Uh, he founded a company called Preloaded. And what Preloaded do is they make games, um, but they make games for education. So if you look on the BBC website, the CBeebies website, the children's BBC version, and there are lots and lots of games there. Um, most of them are made by Phil and his company. They're doing incredibly well. Uh, the other thing that he does. I'm going to turn the volume down here and I'm going to talk over it. Um, so the other thing that his company does is they, they now do an awful lot of VR work. Um, so this is an exhibition of Modigliani's work. Um, at the Tate Modern in London. Um, it closed just before the Christmas before last. So this is a, you know, a year and a bit old, this project now. And what Phil's company did was they recreated Modigliani's studio in virtual reality. Um, so that the, yeah, the kind of viewers, so that the public, there's Phil, um, so that the people who came to the exhibition could also get a kind of sense of what it was like to be the artist through sitting in a chair like his and looking around his artist studio. So really interesting work, I think. And what's particularly interesting here for me is that, you know, this guy's a graphic designer, um, but his practice is very different now. It's related and he looks at everything through his kind of graphic design lens. But, but yeah, his work and his kind of interests has, have developed. Okay, next example. Um, so this is a, a woman called Malika, Malika Falvra. Um, actually, last week, um, there was a cover, the cover for the New Yorker magazine last week was also designed by her. Um, it was an issue about um, the lack of women being nominated for director roles um, at the Oscars. And so she illustrated this. She does an awful lot of, um, yeah, very kind of high profile illustration work for uh, publications like the New Yorker and the Washington Post. She, she actually lives and works in London, um, but an awful lot of her work is in the States. Um, so again, she studied graphic design. She's one of my graduates and she does incredibly well now. Um, she's really prolific. There was a book about her work that came out a few months ago, uh, a monograph of her work. Um, you'll see her work everywhere now. Here she is. I'm just going to show you a second of this. What I like about this, and, and one of the reasons I show this quite often to my students actually, is that there's more examples of the work, but I want them to imagine, you know, I want them to imagine living here, because this is a kind of designer's lifestyle, you know? Um, it's not just about what we do, it's about how we kind of live, how we surround ourselves with these things that are, I guess, kind of motivating, inspiring, there we go. That's Malika. Uh, the next example is a guy called George. So he graduated from my computer animation arts course, um, which is based in Rochester. 
and he only graduated a few years ago. And George is a really interesting one, I think. He, his family are from Nigeria. He was born in London. Um, he is the first of his family to go to university. You know, he's one of these kinds of stories. And he, he really wasn't very confident. Um, but his work was amazing. Uh, one of the reasons I really like his work um, was he was very interested in lighting for virtual environments. And because of my interest in lighting for real environments, there's a kind of relationship. Um, but he's gone on to do some really interesting things. And so he was one of the team, part of the team responsible for this game. Uh, so some of you are going to recognize this. This is a Spider-Man, clearly, for Sony PlayStation 4. Um, so a really interesting first project um, on graduation. So something else quite a lot of you will probably recognize. Um, so this is another one of my graduates from graphic design again, who is now the creative director of a, a design studio in London called Us2. And Us2 have kind of moved from graphic design and branding to other things. And so one of the things they do now is make um, games. And you know, this is incredibly popular. This is a um, Monument Valley. Turn the sound off again. So Monument Valley. Um, Monument Valley is the highest grossing iOS game in China. And you know, it's made by a studio with around about 25 people. They have made a fortune off this. They've done incredibly well. I use this as an example. When, um, when parents are applicants concerned about Money and concerned about customers. And I think there's, there's, you know, clearly money to be made in some areas of the site. Most areas of the site. So, another interesting example. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, the sound's cutting. I keep turning, I think I keep turning off my sound here. So, um, sorry about that. Uh, the next example is a guy called Richard Lyons. He graduated uh, maybe 12 years ago. He was the first graduate that I saw leave um, the graphic design course when I used to be a uh, graphic design course leader here. Um, he's an amazing typographer. Uh, he worked for a couple of interesting design studios in London before then going to San Francisco and working for a company called Design Studio. Um, when he was there, he was part of the team that rebranded Airbnb. And then he was headhunted by Apple. So he, he's now part of the team responsible for the human interface guidelines for Apple products. And actually, the reason I recently worked for Apple, this is a kind of strange thing for me, because I used to recommend students for jobs. Now my graduates recommend me for jobs. So the reason I ended up working for Apple recently was because, because of my graduate. Um, some other things that you might recognize. We're almost at the end of the presentation now. Um, so one of my graduates from animation. Animation is a really, really successful course. Uh, but one of the graduates is a, a woman called Laura Naylor. Um, she, um, yeah, she worked on Isle of Dogs. She was one of the 2D animators. She's also one of the animators for Simon's Cat. So you may have seen this too. I'll just let this play for a second. So pretty cool, eh? There we go. Before Simon's cat gets into trouble, I'll move on. Um, yeah, we have we have really successful graduates from the animation course, and so you you might know Peppa Pig, um, the creator of Peppa Pig, a guy called um, Mark Baker. He's also one of our graduates from the animation course here in Florida. Um, another example, someone that you're going to know, um, is a guy called Mark. Um, he he graduated a long while ago, so he's not one of my graduates, um, but he's done really amazing work. So he graduated from the course here. Uh, so an example of this, and he's worked on lots of Tim Burton films, um, including this one, Corpse Bride. And he was actually also the director of animation for Isle of Dogs. Um, so yeah, a superstar. So moving on, because there's a few more things I want to show you. Um, a 
another amazing graduate from animation is responsible for this guy. You may have seen him, or maybe it's kind of exclusive to the UK at the moment. It's a guy called Hey Dougie. So yeah, super popular. And then I want to finish up with, uh, or this is the penultimate thing, not finishing up. I just want to show you some examples of, examples of some of the games that my graduates go on to make. Um, the computer animation arts course here in Farnham uh, that I was um, responsible for until recently is super successful. Um, all of our graduates go on to work in industry, all of them. All of them go on to work in graduate level jobs. Their starting salary is more than any other graduate of the university. Um, one of the reasons that they're so successful is because we are 10 miles away from Guildford, which is the kind of center of the computer game industry in the UK. Um, so yeah, they're super, super successful. We also do something quite different here, which is that our, our students make games rather than just bits of games. Um, so when they graduate, they all have playable games, um, which then opens doors in industry and they end up working on things like this. So they're, yeah, they're a super talented bunch. But I would say that they probably work twice as hard as any other student here. Um, yeah, they're, they're amazing. Okay, finally, finally, um, and I show this guy as an example of, I think the kind of type of student that we have here. Um, so this is a guy called Gareth Edwards. Gareth uh, graduated before I started working here. And he's a Hollywood film director now. So he, he started off by making a film called Monsters, um, which won lots of awards. It was a low budget film. And um, after Monsters, he went on to direct this, Godzilla. And after Godzilla, he went on to direct this, um, Star Wars The Force Awakens. So he's a superstar and yeah the reason I like to use him as an example is because he's really nice and you know you don't think of people this successful being nice but he's a really nice guy. Um, he you know was kind of regular just like us <laughs> when he first started he kind of didn't know what he wanted to do and he worked really hard. He had really good fun but he worked really hard he had really good friendships. And this is one of the reasons that he's been able to do this kind of work. Some of his friends were really interested in tech, technology and computer special effects. He really wanted to be a director. He learned an awful lot from his peer group, which then he applied on graduation. The other reason I think he's a really good example of one of our graduates is because he continues to be in contact with us. So he comes back to the UK uh, to visit family his family live fairly close to us. Uh, when he comes back to visit his family, he comes back to visit us too, and he does lectures for us. Um, he also helps to uh, helps some of our students and um, through tutorials and things like this. The kind of things that he doesn't need to do, but he does because he, he kind of cares about us because he had a really good experience. So that's pretty cool, wasn't it? So. I think I'm pretty much there. I guess the thing that I want to say in uh, to wrap up, one of the things that I want to say is that through a presentation like this, everything looks easy, you know, and everything looks, you know, it looks like you kind of fall from one thing into another and the work is good because people don't generally present bad stuff. But, but my experience is that, you know, I, I've been lucky, but it's also been a struggle and I've, I've had to work really, really hard and one of the things that I continue to do is I think when I get a bit bored or when I become really familiar with something, I do something else. I take myself somewhere else because for me, I think the most important thing is, is being creative. It's about making stuff. It's about challenging myself and making things that are kind of new. So I'm going to stop. Yeah. So just, just a reminder, that's me. I'm going to stop there because I think I've taken about 50 minutes. And I want to have some time for questions. Uh, stop share. Okay. Okay, so I need to go to questions and answers. Uh, okay, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to just work through your questions and answers uh, one at a time, if that's okay. And 
if anyone has anything else to ask me, you're very welcome to add it to this list. Um, <laughs> so you're a little bit comfy. Um, oh, I tell you what, when I get a bit comfy, I, I feel, when I, get, when I get a bit comfortable, I disrupt things for myself. I go and do something else. Um, so that, that might be travel, actually. Um, I still travel like I did when I was a teenager. So I still travel with a rucksack. Um, I've got kids now and things aren't as easy, but um, yeah, I still travel like, I'm a, like I've got no money. Um, and, and I think this is a really good thing because you come into contact with people in a different way. You know, when I travel for business now, um, you know, I stay in nice hotels. You don't really get to meet people or you only get to meet people like you. You know, that's not really very interesting for me. So yeah, I, I, I travel. I also get really kind of obsessed by things. So I get really, really kind of into things and I indulge myself. I try and find out as much as I possibly can about it. Um, and yeah, so that's what I do. Uh, I also allow myself to be kind of, to be like a child, I think, you know, I'm interested in lots of things and, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, sometimes it's quite difficult to express, uh, express yourself in a way that's kind of acceptable to others. But I accept that sometimes I come across as a, a bit of an idiot and, um, and that's okay. You know, that's okay. Uh, okay. So second question is what are the majors at the university? Well, yeah, have a look at our website. We've got loads. Um, so we, we uh, range from um, uh, kind of architecture, animation, some of the things that I've talked about, uh, fashion, uh, graphic design, illustration, lots of filmmaking. Um, yeah, loads and loads and loads of courses. Pretty much all of our courses though are centered around art and design. Um, we do though now also have um, a new business school, which is kind of a really odd and interesting thing. It's a business school that only focuses on the creative industries um, in reference to the fact that half of the people that work in the creative industries are business brains. Um, so yeah, so we have this other side too, but I would suggest you have a look at our website. We've got loads of information there. Um, so the university, if you just type in UCA, University for the Creative Arts, you'll be able to find it. Um, what do you think? How can I be a designer like this? Or yeah, how can you be a designer like this? Well, I think I think kind of studying and playing and trying to experience as much as you possibly can. Um, you know, I <laughs> I think you have to watch lots of films, you have to read lots, you have to go to lots of exhibitions. Um, I also really like food. You can't see my belly from there. But I really like food. You know, I like I like just I like. I like everything. I like kind of experiencing things. Um, and yeah, that would be my recommendation. Try and experience as much as possible and then evaluate it, analyze it. You know, what do you like about it? Um, you know, what can you learn from it? How could you make it different or better? Um, I think also surround yourself, not completely, but find like-minded people, people who are going to kind of push you and influence you. Um, okay, so do we use any particular software to make animations? Yeah, we use lots, um, ranging from things like Dragon Frame. So Dragon Frame is quite simple for stop frame animation. Um, we do an awful lot of stop frame animation here through to, you know, 3D software. Um, so here we might be using something like Cinema 4D in, uh, in games. Uh, we're using games engines and we're using a variety of different games engines, depending on what the students want to do. Um, is there any free online course for animation arts? Um, we don't have any, but um, I would look at things like LinkedIn Learning. Um, you know, LinkedIn Learning will let you look at some fairly kind of basic, um, yeah, basic courses um, as kind of tasters. Um, then of course, YouTube. I mean, there's so much content in YouTube. You can pretty much learn to do anything through YouTube. Um, you have to sift the content because not everything is great. Um, but what I inevitably do, if I come, come to a, you know, a problem, something I can't solve, 
maybe it relates to Arduino or maybe it relates to something like Adobe XD that we're using quite a lot at the moment. I look on YouTube first and yeah, that, that's a, you know, a really great kind of free resource. Cool. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah. Excellent. Um, Jamie, you've done an amazing job at uh, answering some of uh, the questions in the Q&A there. So thank you. Great. So much. Well, no problem at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll just see um, if you guys have any other questions. We have another minute or two left. Um, so feel free to ask. Um, we can also add in the links to uh, the UCA website so you can find out a bit more about some of the courses that Jamie's been talking about today as well. Great. So I'll just put them into the chat uh, just now. Brilliant. And I, I would suggest everyone, if you're interested in our courses, so for something like animation as an example, we've talked about this a bit, um, if you're interested in the course, look at our website and then what you'll find on the university website is that there's another link. So there's a link through to the animation uh, or the animation courses independent website. And that's really interesting because what you'll find there is show reels of all of the graduates from that course going back to, I think, 2014. Um, there are also, and it's not just, actually, it's not just show reels of graduates, it's also of the second year students. So what you can do is you can see the kind of work that people are producing in the second year. You can then see what people are producing on graduation. And then we have a list of our alumni and it's a really long list. So you can then see what they did once they graduated. So that's good. Um, you can also look at all of the visiting speakers, the people that come in to talk to our students. There's a really long list of those as well. Um, so yeah. Uh, okay. So I've got a couple more questions. Um, Sure. There was one there from uh, Jorge, uh, yeah. which was, um, it, I think it was the same question, um, which I believe you answered, um, but maybe you could just recap because I That's don't software. know about it. Yeah. Which particular yeah. software uh, would you use to... Yeah. To so software wise, we use, I mean, the, I, I guess maybe the slightly long winded, but more appropriate answer is that we use whatever is appropriate for that particular project. So, for example, sometimes Dragon Frame is appropriate if you're making something uh, in a more kind of traditional way. Uh, maybe it's 2D or 3D. Maybe it's kind of drawn. Um, what we then have is copy stands, digital SLRs set up, and Dragon Frame helps you take one photograph at a time, and then it helps you compile it. Um, then we use lots of 3D software. Um, so we use all of the things that you'll be able to get your hands on. So we use uh, Cinema 4D, for example. Uh, we use 3D Studio Max. Um, then for the more kind of interactive work, um, we use, uh, oh, I've got what it's called now, but there are kind of two um, games engines. Can't remember, I'll have to come back to you with that if I can remember it. Um, but really we use, we use whatever's most appropriate. We use things like Premiere, we use Final Cut, uh, yeah, we use whatever's most appropriate for, for your kind of idea. Um, okay, so next question. Interested about the colorful balls recording the light, how to control the random effects. Uh, so how uh, can you imagine the graphic accurately before you record the light for the Sony ads? Well, <laughs> that's a good question, isn't it? You have a, I have kind of an idea in my head about what it is that I want. Um, so when I was making those machines, I had an idea hunch that it was going to work in this particular way um, but actually what I had to do was you know I, I showed you one example I showed you the kind of final thing I must have made 25 machines before I came to that one um, so it is a it's a you know process of kind of refining and evaluating and remaking and remaking and getting really frustrated before then you know getting to a point where it kind of works um, so yeah, it takes, so yeah, I've got an idea. The really difficult thing is trying to kind of realize that kind of vision that you've got in your head. Uh, yeah, Blender is something as well that our, our students use, absolutely. Um, 
I think there's a thing as well where, you know, we encourage our students to be very kind of experimental. And it means that they'll end up using some software that we don't understand because we're not familiar with it. Um, I like this about being a, you know, a teacher, a tutor um, at degree level and postgraduate level. Um, you know, often our students have got much more kind of experience of something than we have um, because they're really interested in the kind of narrow area. Um, so if there's a piece of software that's better for what it is that you want to do, absolutely use it. Um, and yeah, one of the things that I think our students kind of often expect is that, you know, I'm going to be an expert at everything. And, um, and I'm really only an expert in a couple of things. You know, or, or a couple of very narrow areas of those couple of things. Um, yeah, so I, I uh, yeah, so I think it's kind of interesting. We're all kind of learning together. And I think that's one of the great things about uh, uh, an environment like this, that, you know, often we're doing things at the same time. Okay. Cool. All right, guys. Um, I think that is... Uh, all about all we have time for today because I know that Jamie is uh, going to head off to pick up kids from school so I definitely can't, can't wait for that um, yeah. Yeah, I would just like to say a really big thank you Jamie for joining us today and for a really fascinating presentation uh, very wide-ranging really interesting I'm gonna go and listen to some Taprazuki uh, right now yeah. in fact yeah. so as a result of it so thank you and a uh, very big thanks guys for, for joining us as well for today's session. I've put a link um, in the chat to our upcoming webinars. We have a number of other webinars in this series uh, coming up next week. So feel free to register for them. If we didn't answer any questions uh, today, uh, you'll have another chance to ask them and there might be some common ground for other presenters as well. So. Don't worry, you'll have another chance, okay? Uh, so, Great. Sorry, really nice to meet you, everyone, and good luck with whatever it is you, you choose to do. And any questions, just, you know, just email us. We've got all of our contact details on our website, and we're, we're pretty friendly. Mm. Yeah? Sorry. Sounds good. Excellent. Thank you uh, so much, Jamie. It was really nice to meet you. And yeah, thanks, nice to meet you, too. Uh, yeah, have thanks. a great weekend. And, uh, thanks, Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.